All right. Hello, everyone. Everyone in the room, everyone uh, out there in old Zoom land. Uh, welcome to today's PSU Transportation Seminar. My name is Jennifer Dill, and I will be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our PSU Transportation Seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. These seminars are once again being held live on Portland State University's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Wallala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important that we acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on our on the indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember these communities and honor their legacy lives and descendants. Today, we are very pleased to have Kelly Rogers presenting on the use and influence of health indicators in municipal transportation plans. Kelly Rogers is a PhD candidate very, very soon to be Dr. Kelly Rogers, putting the finishing touches on the dissertation. Very proud to be the chair of the dissertation. I'm going off script here, so apologies. Uh, a PhD candidate in urban studies and planning, or urban studies at Portland State University, and the owner and executive director of Street Smart Planning. Kelly has 18 years of experience working across disciplines to create healthy, equitable, and sustainable cities. Her previous work includes the development of a performance based transportation planning tool, creation of a pedestrian plan, and the development of a quality of life framework with principles, indicators, and proven strategies. Her current research is on the use and influence of health indicators, um, which she's going to be talking about today. Kelly is also a member of the TRB's uh, Transportation Research Board Committee on Transportation and Health and is chair of the Institute for Transportation Engineers, Transportation and Health Committee and co-chairs the Health Equity and Planning Interest Group at the American Planning Association. Before we get on to her presentation, I want to give a preview of some upcoming um, Friday seminars. Um, in a couple of weeks, we have Dr. Lee Ming Wang uh, from Portland State University about regional variation of effects of the built environment on driving. And then uh, during research week at PSU on May 11th, uh, we're going to have Tiani Lee and Bas Kalazabi, who are from Trek and run on Portal. And we're going to celebrate 20 years of Portal, uh, which is an online um, data archive, transmission data archive. And then on May 25th, Peter Coons from the city of Portland. So I hope we'll see some of you in person and on the web for those. I am also happy to announce the return of the Ann Niles Active Transportation Lecture and Luncheon. And this year we are featuring um, Oregon Metro Council President Lynn Peterson, who has just uh, released a book about roadways for people, and we hope to see some of you there. For those of you who are online on Zoom, uh, we are recording uh, the webinar. We will be posting the video and the slides on our website afterwards. Um, and if you have questions to ask, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. You can type them in at any time. We'll field all the questions at the end of the presentation. And without further ado, I want to pass it over to soon to be Dr. Rogers. Oh. Well, Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Brain spacing. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, everyone, for attending and listening in. Uh, so my presentation was on the use and influence of health indicators and municipal transportation plans. Oh, make sure you click on that slide so it's out of zoom sorry back up great okay 
So just a brief overview. Um, my introduction, I'm going to introduce my research questions, talk about methodology, and then I'm going to go into the use of institutionalization and decision-making component of my dissertation. And then I'll move on to social learning and policy change, and then wrap it up with the final conclusion. So my research questions were, how are health indicators used in transportation plans? What factors are responsible for their use? And how influential are health indicators in shaping transportation decisions? What factors explain their influence? So as uh, just some background concepts that I'm drawing from some pretty diverse literatures um, about indicators, um, they're a form of technical information that informs policymaking and public health. They inform evidence-based policy. Um, they can be used instrumentally, conceptually, and politically. I'll get to that more later. And the idea of use and influence has been inconsistently defined in the research. So when I'm talking about indicators, I'm talking about measurable constructs that represent a condition out in the world. And um, there may be a metric associated with indicators, a specific way that you measure it. In transportation, we tend to use the term performance measure instead. So that's the same idea, um, or sometimes an objective is used at that indicator level. And then again, the metric or performance measure. And there's many different ways to categorize indicators, but two, one way that's important is to think about it for my research as an outcome or an output. So an outcome is the desired condition that you want to see. An output is an activity. So when I talk about use, influence, and institutionalization, uh, by use, I mean it was handled in a transportation process. It was reported, it was discussed. By influence, I am defining that for the purpose of my research as administrative decision making, which is the first part, and then as social learning or policy learning and policy change is the second part. And institutionalization is that it is integrated into agency routines. That is, it is basically an administrative decision making repeated. So for my methodology, I did a case study of five cities, Boston, Denver, Indianapolis, Memphis, and Seattle. Um, I chose them uh, through a process of uh, whittling down cities that were a population between 600 and 900,000 people. So I wanted to have some consistency in size. But then within that, I diversified other characteristics, including population density, household income, race and ethnicity, and geographic location. And then I reviewed their transportation plans. Many were the primary transportation plans, which could have been part of a comprehensive plan. Sometimes they were modal plans as well. I looked at city and transportation budgets because as an organizational factor, I wanted to see what level of resource the city had to be able to implement or institutionalize indicators or manage them. Um, if they had prior experience with data-driven management, which was primarily their participation participation and um, certification in the What Works program by Bloomberg Philanthropies, and then informant interviews. So I interviewed 34 people from a range of different, uh, a range of different actors from inside and outside of the agency. So the first part with the city of Boston on the use and institutionalization, um, the two plans I looked at was Go Boston 2030 Vision and Action Plan, and then the Go Boston uh, Vision Zero uh, Boston Action Plan. So both of these were created by the newly elected mayor at the time, Mayor Walsh. Um, Go Boston in particular had a very extensive engagement process, um, and indicators were developed by consultants and staff collaboratively, um, kind of drawing from the engagement process. It was the first time indicators had been used in a transportation plan. Vision Zero had less extensive engagement as part of plan development. They do more work at a project level. And they only had one goal or indicator, which is very common for Vision Zero, which is eliminate fatal and serious crashes. So there are different use cases. There are ways that indicators could be used as part of the transportation plan. One was existing conditions. Another is prioritization, which is developing project lists in the plan or as part of capital improvement programming, and then there's systems monitoring, which is looking at indicators over time and how, they're, and how the city is performing. So what I found in an existing conditions use case, this was the opportunity for drawing attention to issues that were important to the community. 
And so one of the things that rose to the top was were issues around equity and affordable travel to jobs and racial disparities and travel time. There were no major issues around the usability of the indicators. So I looked at indicator factors and I looked at organizational factors. So there weren't major concerns at this point. The city was funded to do the research, not an issue. One of the things that indicators kind of helped do is force collaboration between different departments because they had to figure out data sources and share data. At the prioritization use case, it went as intended. There was a prioritized project list that was the plan for Go Boston. However, they didn't make the decision to do capital improvement programming and use the indicators as evaluation criteria until after the plan was adopted. And so they had some bumps in the implementation of a, in, in doing that as a result. The indicator usability issue that came up here at this particular use case was the spatial scale of the data. Because if you're prioritizing, you really need to have brain for enough data to make a decision about this corridor, that corridor, this neighborhood versus that neighborhood. Health data was especially difficult because it is aggregated at such a large geographic scale. There were some other cultural issues around just familiarity with indicators. Like I said, it was the first time that Boston had used indicators as part of the Go Boston plan. And so they weren't accustomed to referencing it in decision making. For the systems monitoring use case, more indicator usability issues started to come up here. Um, crash data um, was widely considered problematic. That is consistent through all of the cities. Um, but it was also really interesting because when there were improvements to crash data, it really enabled agencies to make a difference, make, a, um, make improvements for safety. For accountability purposes, whether or not an indicator was readily measurable was another challenge. And so for long-term monitoring and kind of watchdogging, like the agency, if a, an advocacy group couldn't measure the indicator, they had trouble tracking whether or not the city was delivering on their promises. Another thing was around those outcome measures. So outcome measures are they're difficult. To, it's difficult to attribute change to any given project or program because an outcome, um, you know, either the data collected takes too long for it to be like showing up frequently to be able to assess progress, um, or it's something that's so small it just barely makes a dent in something that's really large. And so if you think about something around like maternal health or you know like even mode share for transport for bicycling, it may take a really long time before you see those numbers move. Um, and the other thing is systems monitoring, while they had lots of resources to develop the plan, it was they didn't have resources to do the ongoing management and maintenance of the data. Um, and so that kept them from being able to monitor the indicators over time. Um, Vision Zero, however, had an online dashboard, they had a crash map, they had a lot more of that happening. It's uh, Vision Zero just being inherently a lot more like data driven. Um, there was a nonprofit organization that did a progress report that kind of helped, helped hold the city's feet to the fire in terms of being able to deliver on promises. So here are some quotes that illustrate some of these findings. Um, in terms of drawing attention to an issue, Go Boston perhaps put a real pin on travel, affordable travel and access to jobs on the scale of the data. We wanted to look at obesity data. It's useful for planning, but it's not that useful for like, you should put a sidewalk on the street. On accountability, the Livable Streets Progress Report absolutely made the city like change decisions or time, timelines. It did light a fire under them. And on cultural familiarity, we haven't had indicators in the past. That's not something that's been a topic of conversation. It's not been part of the culture of these departments. So Denver was my next city. Um, there are three plans, two plans really that I examined. The comprehensive plan is an overarching plan that kind of frames up some of these other planning efforts, particularly Blueprint Denver. Blueprint Denver was adopted in 2019. It's a land use and transportation plan. Um, it was so it was led by the community planning and development, also the first time indicators were used, whereas Denver Moves, Pedestrian and Trails was in the Public Works Department instead, also the first use of indicators. And the quote here sort of illustrates, I think sort of encapsulates kind of the major lesson from Denver. If after five years we've seen that we've had great success with four of the six indicators or whatever, 
the intent was like, okay, what are we not getting done in these other two? Should we apply more resources to it? It should help us be more strategic about setting our work program going forward. I don't think it's influenced it quite yet. So in the existing conditions use case, again, opportunities to draw attention to issues. The attention drawing only happened in the existing conditions use cases. That did not happen in subsequent use cases for any of the cities. Um, and again, this was focused on equity, health equity, and inequitable project delivery in terms of geographic distribution um, of investments. Again, sufficient technical resources, financial resources for the plan. And there was, again, more kind of collaboration on data, particularly between the health department and the planning department around some of those health equity measures. In the prioritization, um, that was not part of Blueprint Denver, so that wasn't a planned use case, uh, but it was for Denver Moves pedestrians. And again, in terms of the indicator usability issues, spatial scale was, again, a concern. Um, the thing that was interesting about the capital improvement programming is that they that for Blueprint Denver, they did not use evaluation criteria. They used systems monitoring indicators to inform discussion. And that didn't um, that didn't work as well. So for the systems monitoring use case, there were a lot of concerns about the time lag associated with using secondary data like the census. Uh, again, issues around outcome attribution it was really hard to evaluate whether or not you're making progress. Um, one of the things that did happen here and in, in, in almost all of the Kate cities was an evolution of metrics over time, which is fine because it's showing that they're using the, the indicators. Um, there was integration into routines that repeated use. So Denver has successfully like been reporting out on indicators, but like I said, they were using systems monitoring indicators for like basically a capital improvement program. And it wasn't a clear enough procedural link for people that execute decisions effectively. One of the things they did have going for them was a data-driven mirror. So that was a big part of this platform and drove a lot of agency um, work. And they had a culture of learning. They did a diagnostic on the previous blueprint to learn how to do something differently. And that's where actually the idea of indicators came up. And in this case, they had sufficient resources to do the monitoring. Okay, so some quotes to illustrate this. Um, on the mayor, the administration here in Denver is very, very keen on getting a metric-driven city. When the budget goes through the CIP, the departments are justifying their budget requests on how well they are actually implementing the comprehensive plan. So that was the intention. Blueprint indicators to count updates to council were a good half hour of city council just free associating on their fears and anxieties and nothing to do with like, are we getting where we're going? So that's about that mismatched use case. There's a real understandable lean towards using data that's going to be available anyway. So the American Community Survey census type data, data that not only has the credibility, you know, with also being collected and can be compared across cities, but it's very slow, it's very delayed, it's very infrequent. There's a course correction needed, will you know before it's too late? So Indianapolis, I looked at two different plans. One is uh, the pedestrian plan, walkways, and uh, the other was Indy Moves Transportation Integration Plan. Both of these were an outgrowth of a larger comprehensive planning effort. Um, in the first, a nonprofit organization actually secured a grant to produce um, the pedestrian plan. It was the first pedestrian plan the city had ever adopted, um, and it was the first use of indicators. Um, Indy Moves was adopted by the Metropolitan Development Commission, not the City Council, and there were some informants that felt that it lacked some teeth as a result because it had to be taken at the council level. Also, the first time indicators have been used, and the quote that sums this up, um, I don't think it's because the data isn't usable or available, it's because of the systems. We do not have the systems in place to use the data the way they are intended to be used. So existing conditions, some again, some similar themes of the issues that were drawn attention to safety, affordability, equity. They had sufficient resources for plan development, again, and there was high collaboration between departments, except for the police, and that showed up a few times about how the police was not a very helpful partner in transportation conversations. 
prioritization. Um, so they actually did successfully use an equity, some of the equity mapping that they had done as part of the plan to prioritize which streets got resurfaced first. And then also um, they submitted projects to the Metropolitan Planning Organization um, that were much more active and health oriented um, than before. One of the things that is a challenge for Indianapolis is that there's no transportation department. Um, and so there is one position dedicated to transportation who is supposed to kind of bridge the planning and public works department. For symptoms monitoring, again, crash data, highly problematic. It was so, so bad from police departments. Um, but they were able to make safety improvements once that crash data was cleaned up. Um, there was a lot of questioning of the value of outcome measures for all the reasons that I mentioned before. And informants felt there was generally a lack of departmental and elected leadership in being able to promote either data-driven approach um, or anything uh, related to like health indicators. Indianapolis is also one of the least resourced cities. Um, when I looked at the budget, those are second lowest, do not have much capacity. So some quotes to illustrate the, um, in terms of prioritization, after any moves, the city was in the moment where they were very willing to cut expansion projects that were planned. They came back to the MPO and took out like literally dozens of expansion projects to prioritize pedestrian and bike projects. Um, regarding organizational systems, nobody is asking for the data. It's nobody's job to collect it each quarter or each month. Outcome measures. You're not actually going to see a change on obesity over one year, three years, or maybe even five years, let alone attribute any change to the pedestrian plan. It's fine, but what is it really telling us, and does it really matter? On um, organizational culture and leadership, the day-to-day -day staff wants data-driven planning. I don't think they're largely empowered to do it on their own, though. Not everybody wants, particularly pol politically appointed people, not everybody wants this level of transparency. So for the city of Memphis, I looked at um, their comprehensive plan, which had a transportation element. That was the primary, primary transportation plan for the city. Um, it was an idea that had emerged from the Office of Performance Management, which is an office that's located in the executive suite. Um, it was led by the Office of Comprehensive Planning, which was a new office funded for this effort. It's the first comprehensive plan that had been made for the city since 1981. And it was a radically different change in strategy of build up, not out, because Memphis had relied a lot on annexation and perhaps um, Israel had a very sprawling city. The indicators were co developed by the Office of Performance Management and the Office of Comprehensive Planning, and it was adopted by both the city and the county because although the city, uh, the city and county are not one united agency like it is an agency uh, in Denver, but the land use portion is. So existing conditions, so it was a little different in this case than rather the city framing up which indicators and in like generating conversation among community members, um, they did a very extensive engagement process and residents actually brought issues to the city's attention. In this case, like transit was a major, major one. Um, they had an unusual use case um, of doing growth scenarios where there was some market data that influenced the plan direction that was also informed by um, values of equity. Um, prioritization was not a planned part um, of Memphis 3.0. And then systems monitoring, this was kind of the primary vision for how indicators would be used. They were um, they were not actually specified within Memphis 3.0. There were some high-level indicators, but no metrics. So those metrics were developed later between the Office of Performance Management and the Office of Comprehensive Planning. Um, as a result, it just felt like they weren't very clearly connected to the plan. Um, and so uh, the Office of Comprehensive Planning staff had a little trouble figuring out how to use them. They also have a data-driven mayor, mayor um, as uh, made clear by the fact that he has an office of performance management. There's a dashboard. They had the lowest financial resources of all the cities, but they had this dedicated office for managing indicators um, and relied a lot on philanthropy and local relations and local funders to, to make things happen. 
Um, and then the mayor has this dashboard review. So that like indicator management is a very active part of at least for him um, decision making and informing him. So here are some quotes. Um, the division is having a hard time tracking and measuring because the outcomes and indicators are not direct linked directly to actions. The mayor's dashboard review meetings were not used to discipline department leaders. Instead, it was more, we've seen this issue over and over again. What do you, what can we do to fix it? What do you all need? Um, the um, Office of Comprehensive Planning and staff is willing to use the dashboard, but struggled to figure out how to use quarterly annual indicators. Like, what is the audience for that? Where does that fit? How do we use that? So the city of Seattle, um, so Move Seattle was a mayoral initiative and it was associated with a nine year, 930 million transportation levy. So there was definitely funding um, available for planning and implementation. The Seattle Pedestrian Master Plan was an update of a previous plan. There were indicators in the previous plan. Um, there was less engagement, more reliance on the standing advisory committee. Uh, the bicycle master plan, also an update. The main change here was a shift in focus from vehicular cyclists to an all ages and ability networks. Um, they also had updated indicators, similarly, um, more reliance on an advisory board. And then the sum up quote here indicators help us stop, point back to why we made decisions, why certain projects have risen to the top. It makes a lot of our work a lot more defendable, especially when they become controversial and bike projects like to become. So existing conditions, no major new issues kind of came up in these plans, um, but there was this new approach for the bicycle master plan around all ages and ability. Spatial scale data was a concern. Um, it was, again, it was health data because of the aggregation at such a large geographic scale. Um, they had a very deep, detailed, highly defensible prioritization methodology to recommend a strong capital improvement program and a culture um, of using indicators. Again, they've had years and years to, and a agency and leadership behind them to institutionalize indicators into decision making. And so systems monitoring, there was also the tension between the outputs and the outcomes. And so they were trying to move towards outcomes, um, but uh, and preferred that, thought that was better, but they had some, some challenges around it. And again, lots of funding and an oversight board, which really focused on output measures, because that was what they felt they could be accountable for. It's like, what projects did you build? And the other thing that was unique to Seattle is that they had council required reporting and implementation reports so that it was actually legislated that they that the city needed to report on indicators so some quotes um, around culture i would have been called out internally for having an incomplete plan if i didn't have performance measures to report on on um, elected leadership there were certain council members who would hold the staff's feet to the fire and say you missed that april 1 deadline and then that output outcome tension. Staff were very reluctant and or stressed to deviate from what they had programmed because if they did, they may not hit their deliverable goals that were output focused. And so it became really hard to align those things with the rest of the program that was not levy funded because the levy was such a big dominant thing in what the city was delivering. And accountability. The voter approval accountability structure is very focused on are you doing the things you promised, which are about outputs, not outcomes, not are you doing the most important things. So what I had initially proposed began my research is that indicators would be used when they were easily integrated in routines, um, but also if the agency had done some learning and evaluated their process and did some changes, um, and that they were influential depending on how deeply embedded they were in the use case. Um, and that means the clarity. So again, Denver had great institutionalization, repeated routine, but it wasn't the right match. Um, influence depends on an influential champion. For administrative decision making, politics were there, but mostly it's these organizational factors that were most important. And we'll get to uh, those factors in just a moment. So the next part is on social learning and policy change. So remember, these are how uh, two other ways that I define influence of indicators. One was the administrative decision making. Now we're on learning and policy change. So briefly, social learning, like drawing from political science theory and organizational science, the 
the idea that like the beliefs are the glue of politics. This is like how coalitions get formed, how how thing people align, get things done. And policy changing, policy learning is a change in thought about policy goals and solutions. It is a way to make policy change, although usually incremental. And then from planning, you get communicative learning, which is that this policy learning, if you do it through dialogue, um, it produces learning. So some of the factors that explain whether or not this happens is the attributes of the forums, the kind of places, level of engagement, et cetera, level of conflict between coalitions, the type of information you have, and basically all of the strategies and the beliefs of the policy actors. Policy change, we're talking about minor policy change, which is uh, sometimes called single loop learning, which is a change in, in means or strategies to achieve your goal. But major policy change is reevaluating your goals and like what are we really trying to accomplish? And so it's theorized major policy change is likely to occur with a shock to the policy subsystem, like a crisis or some other kind of focusing event. And so some of the explanatory factors are changes in cultural values, legal system, or more dynamic factors, like there's an election or a crisis. Um, and then also it's kind of mediated by the short-term and long-term constraints of policy actors. There's two paradigms to keep in mind when talking about those goals. So there's sort of conventional versus people-centered transportation. You can call that automobility versus you know, people-centered. Um, and then kind of a more power politics versus data-driven management, so more of a management style. Um, and this is an example of the kind of power politics. The approach that has been used historically has been a non-linear, non-transparent, non-data-driven approach where projects do, where projects get done and when projects get done. It's not equitable. It's largely based on power and community dynamics. So what I found is that the selection of indicators is actually the first step of this learning or framing. So people think of indicators as neutral, but they're not. They've been chosen by someone. And if they've been chosen in a community process, then they reflect the values of the community. Um, but oftentimes it's city planners or other people inside the city that are actually making suggestions about which things. So they actually are. Um, using their values to inform which indicators are, are um, get attention. And so they did draw attention to issues, especially equity. That was the overwhelming one in all the cities. Um, and as I mentioned before, the development of indicators, the existing conditions process um, is the greatest opportunity for learning. In terms of policy change, there were policy changes and goals around people-centered transportation. And then there were also policy changes around data-driven management, except Seattle, which had already made that change. So it was new for them as part of this plan. In terms of some of those explanatory factors, um, attributes of forums, all of them had very pretty extensive public engagement processes or reliance on a standing advisory committee, um, which was more Seattle's situation. And the indicators were built from planned goals by consultants and staff. So like members of the public didn't get involved in the nitty gritty of which metrics to use, but that the, they were informed by an engagement process and a co-development process. Um, the information for the most part was measurable and many of them were kind of more socially oriented, not just environmental. There's sort of theories about the more measurable and scientific they are, the, the, the more likely that they'll have an influence. And I found, like, as I mentioned before, staff often acted as policy brokers, like working between coalitions or trying to figure out how to create a solution or policy entrepreneurs, which are like, I want you know, like this solution to be adopted. Um, but residents framed problems in Boston and Memphis um, as compared to like city actors. And then in general, everyone had shared beliefs among the mission of the organization, plan documents, values of city staff, and members of the larger advocacy coalition. So there was basically only one coalition present. And I say that in the context of the advocacy coalition framework, political science framework, that's talking about the level of conflict and whether or not you have competing uh, coalitions that are vying for certain policy solutions. So in these cases, we only have one coalition present and no opposition. So it was low level of conflict, and then the indicators weren't weaponized. So what we find in high conflict situations is that indicators actually become 
um, charged and an opportunity for debate and their credibility gets challenged. This never came up in any of my cases. So policy learning, it takes thinking outside the box to measure things that people don't know about yet, and then it changes the conversation. The fact that Black Bostonians spend so many more hours a year commuting than white bus riders was shocking to people. I actually put a number on it and made people go, whoa, that's a big deal. Basically, all the low-income areas of the city include pretty substantial areas of either missing or substandard sidewalk. This disparity was very clear to everyone as part of the process. A lot of the shock came from the expense of transportation in the Indianapolis region because, yeah, housing is cheap here and our wages are super low, too. Like, because we lack regional transit, there's a huge gap in regional job accessibility, and it makes the combined <clears throat> housing and transportation transportation costs, the third highest in the country among our peer metros, and that usually takes people aback. So I wanted to spend a little more time on <clears throat> argument and framing. So I was looking at health indicators when I talk about health indicators and using social determinants of health, which is a little broader than actual drug measures of health, um, like rates of chronic disease, but I'm actually looking at things like active transportation or other things like that. And so I was curious, though, if you frame these indicators as health, did that make a difference in their adoption? So, um, and just the role of argument in general. So it was the dialogue, quite frankly. You're sitting in a small group around a table with people who live in this community going, whoa, wait a minute here. And it's like, oh, I have not thought about that. I think there are a lot of people, including many of the staff members who are like, this is a lot bigger conversation than we intended. This is focused on equity. The data that you show pushes your agenda. The fact that we are even calling out and even researching how expensive it is to travel in Indianapolis and the disparity, I mean, that conveys a value. I think where you can use the data and the indicators, not just the numbers, but the point, the narrative, the messaging around that, when you can use that with a broader audience that includes not just the public, but civic leadership, community stakeholders, or organizational type partners, I do think that can push leadership. And this is specifically about the health framing. Having different motivations is all right. The beauty of it was that you had all these benefits that you could talk about. The YIMBYs learn how to speak health and the transit people learn how to talk land use. Land use. I don't hear health indicators other than perhaps vision zero from anyone else. And then there was some skepticism around transportation as a health solution. <clears throat> There are negative health indicators in the African American community, and your solution to that is just giving them bike lanes. Like, how does that help? I don't really care if they care about health if they're doing the right things. I don't need you to understand the benefit to physical activity rates or chronic disease rates or whatever. I just want you to build a complete street. If you build a complete street because you think it's going to increase property values or because the business owner who's a big campaign donor gives you money and says to do it, good. I don't care. Do the right thing. So uh, in summary, around policy change, all the plans shifted with a greater focus on safety, accessibility, and equity. Staff and nonprofit organizations were central to developing these policy goals, not elected leadership. Um, and in addition, um, Seattle was able to use one of the indicators in their transit plan, which I did not review, but um, to buy additional service hours to be able to meet their access to transit transit measures, so it could, indicators can be really compelling politically. The Meyer policy learning was around the, you know, as a change in means, not a change in goals, was um, data-driven, uh, what management was new to all cities except Seattle, um, and elected leadership was more important here, and sometimes departmental leadership. Um, in terms of the factors that explain the change, it seemed like there was a, there, all the cities kind of talked about this change in cultural values and transportation that they were hearing safety and equity and all these things that they hadn't heard from the public before. In terms of dynamic parameters, there was a mayoral initiative, like, but no other cities had major um, change. And there weren't any other shocks, but there were inflection points per one, which I think I have a quote on. <clears throat> so um, we actually have a policy in Blueprint Denver that states pedestrians are priorities on every street in Denver. And being more inclusive in our processes, we better understand the needs of those communities. 
It's a completely new way to go about business to be more responsive to people. So that culture shift. When you start looking at reduced crashes, I mean, everybody wants that. But there's a different culture now where people are pushing back saying, no, we want traffic calming. We don't want our seven-year-olds getting killed as they cross the street for school because we don't have a lot of pedestrian infrastructure. The inflection point is critical. You know, when you talk about COVID and social justice, you're talking about major national and even international inflection points. <laughs> but an inflection point can be local too. You just have to figure out what it is, right? So um, I'm just going to skip to the summary here. So informants describe how the values of indicators was not just in the numbers, but the point, the narrative. And even before indicators are presented for public discussion, policy actors consider how an indicator serves the narrative they would like to construct. Our public discussion and communicative processes, either through public engagement within advisory committees or during workshops, produce further learning. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Illustrating that it was the dialogue, quite frankly, that enabled indicators to produce social learning. And land development processes with low levels of conflict facilitated social learning. Um, so there were no shocks required for minor policy change, that's data-driven management. But a shift towards people-centered transportation is a major policy change. No shocks to the system required, however, which is kind of contrary to what's theorized. So um, I just focused my takeaways on practice for this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so it would be best to co-develop indicators with inclusive processing if you want um, them to reflect the values of your community and to facilitate social learning or right, draw attention to issues. <clears throat> and consider you, the indicator usability criteria. Um, there's different things that are important for each use case. For existing conditions, it's mostly just availability, um, not too complicated. Prioritization, the spatial scale is important for systems monitoring. You need it to be measurable, reliable, at the right spatial scale, and have a frequency of collection and reporting that's useful. I recommend a mix of outcome and output measures. <clears throat> you want outcomes for that diagnostic, where are we, and for setting direction, but you don't use that for near-term progress or evaluating projects. And output measures are great for accountability, but they're not good for setting direction. And make sure that the indicators fit into a specific routine or an analysis. So make sure you've got a really clear use case for them that in order for them to inform decision making. And then it helps to have accountability mechanisms such as progress reports or having council required reporting. I believe, yep, that's all I have. All right. Thank you for sharing. Oh, I don't have any questions. I don't have any to give. Okay. I can answer. Okay. Okay. I I've got some questions online. I'm sure we'll have some questions in the room. I'm going to start with this one online. Uh, so it's it's very uh, specific, but I think very useful. So I'm just going to read it out here. Um, good afternoon. I'm Ronnie Narula Woods, and I am the Strategic Initiatives Superintendent at LA Metro. Two questions, and maybe I'll just do the first one and have you answer and go to the second. When determining measures or indicators, transit properties often look to department cities, agencies of similar size, demographics, or service offerings. How has your work across these unique locations informed your thinking on grouping and or identifying peer properties or locations uh, to prove out best practices pertaining to health outcomes? So. Yeah, so I, when I selected my cases, I used the population size as the the constant variable. And I think that I think the size of the city is one of the largest things. I wanted to see if differences in geography <clears throat> made a difference on outcomes. And it, it didn't really, where Memphis, for example, had a really high use of institutionalization, and so did Seattle. And they were on opposite ends of the spectrum or on almost every every characteristic that I identified in terms of income, race, um, geography, all of those things. That said, I do think 
This is blood from my research and more from my practice. I do think it's important like that geography seems to matter to practitioners. And so, um, and there may be some cultural elements that even if it's not real, it's perceived as important. So I actually think cities like Indianapolis and Memphis might have a lot more in common and would be worth like studied with each other. And that when you're looking at peer cities that you consider geography and, um, and, and maybe kind of culture as well. Like I think both of those cities are kind of blue dots and red states, for example. And so they have some similar dynamics between the city and, and the state that are relatable. Um, I also think like if you're in the South, you want to see examples from the South, um, and particularly less maybe for transit, but and, and certainly for land development. When you think about street maintenance, if you're in the North and you have snow, you want to see other cities that deal with snow just to increase credibility. So I don't know if that's answering all the questions. But. And then the second question, narrowing down, could you share one or two indicators that you think should be prioritized and can't be measured? And um, the question for different time frames. So, like in a one year for your annual budget versus two years versus uh, five years, which would be a longer term. Yeah. I think in general, I would rely on output measures for things for the near term. And that's probably like from one to five years. So, I think miles of protected bicycle lanes or something like that would be useful, but that needs to be connected with like mode share and, and like whether or not, because you want to see whether or not that particular strategy is actually helping you reach your longer term goal for mode share. And you could track that on an annual basis as well. It just may not tell you very much until a later point in time. Um, and I don't know if I have any other like specific measures. And there were some informants that were you know, as an alternative to an output measure, they just said, just have time bound actions, like just specify what you were going to do in a specific time frame, and then measure that against the outcome. So that's an alternative um, to using an output measure. And this was a part of the question is something I like, what were some of the most common measures that you saw across the five cities? Right. To get an idea. Yeah, so the, the kind of categories that I looked at for health indicators were um, kind of access, like access to employment or to transit, um, and then traffic safety and air quality and climate change and physical activity, active travel. And so almost every, I think every plan addressed um, or every city addressed um, access and addressed physical activity and, a, and traffic safety. What was less consistent was air quality and climate change. Um, and they were the most indicators, um, not just you know a topic covered, but most indicators around the accessibility, traffic, and physical activity. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question that begins that conversation I had yeah. right before this. You say accessibility. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So I also included yeah universal design and ADA access. I will say that was less explicit than. The measures of access to transit or access to employment. But if a city included that, then I counted that in that access bucket. I'm going to uh, open it up to the room. Any questions here before I go back online? Just looking at each other. I've got a couple questions online, and I am, but I'm going to. Go online. Dan Point uh, has a couple questions. Um, did you look at changes, actions, projects that followed after the plan's policy? Right, right, right. Yes, and that would be uh, that would be like next step. So, um, for a lot of reasons that I won't get into, unless someone asks about them. But I was looking at the plan development process and institutional within the agency, the next step where, you know, kind of there's like the programming, which is another process, and then there's the project implementation, which is a third process, and it's all kind of part of the same policy subsystem, but I only looked at this one component, and I, if I were to do this again or do a part two, I think I would really focus on capital improvement programming is that link between the planning and the implementation. 
Um, or, you know, if I have lots of time, the whole, the, you know, from beginning to end of the process, because I think that would, that would say a lot more um, certainly around leadership and not around like the culture. Like, is it true that there was this big shift in people-centered transportation in all these cities? Or is that only in the plan development process? And then once you get to implementation, that's where all the opposition shows up. So I think those are things that would be really interesting to study. Right. I just want to make sure there's no questions here. Um, I have some questions in my own. I want to put. And I had the uh, pleasure of reading the dissertation, so I know the work a lot more than <laughs> just this 40 minute presentation. Um, and so, one of the things that struck me is there seemed to be a lot of evidence that this indicators, when they were used in that initial like defining problem, et cetera, phase, um, could be very effective. At, at revealing things that people didn't know and that showed up in your uh, learning and everything. And, but then when it gets to later on, the monitoring, the decision making and the monitoring, that's where it got more difficult, particularly the monitoring. And that's where you got into issues of spatial scale and timeliness, et cetera. Um, and so looking forward, um, and I don't know if this came up in your interviews or not. Do you see any potential for improvements or addressing that with big data or other things? Like, do you think things are going to get better with data availability or tracking? You know, one of the things that came up in Seattle was that there had already been a huge leap in the, in the improvement of data quality around bicycle stuff, and that there had also been a huge change. I mean, I can't remember off the top of my head when the first bicycle district like plan was done in Seattle, but it was something like the difference between 2007 and 2014 or 2009 and 2017, something like that. There had been all of this work that had been done around data and that did make their life a lot easier. Um, and best practices were had emerged at that time too that had changed. So. I think to some degree, I think the thing that or the area where it would be the greatest benefit and, and I think potential for improvement now is around crash data. It was really clear that the current state of practice is not good. And, um, but I think there are a lot, there's a lot of attention on that right now and a lot of opportunity to improve that. And the thing about crash data that's different from a lot of these other things, like if you think about an access to employment measure where you're looking at this, you know, drawing a half mile radius around something, crash data is like point data, very specific. And so you get this clarity of information that's not available in many of the other indicators and that enables it uh, um, more readily able to be used to make a difference. Are there specific improvements in the crash data that you would prioritize or that these cities? You know, the main, so it sounds like there's a lot of concern around police reporting of data. And part of that is because there's not standardized forms. And so if we can move to a process of having standardized forms and not relying on police narratives, um, which may or may not capture information, then that would go a really long way. Um, and it sounds like it's, it's difficult to kind of link EMS data to police data, but there are some improvements that are starting to be made in that where you could get better sociodemographic information associated to. Great. I've got a, a couple, a few more good questions here from online. Uh, did inputs from health departments uh, were, were inputs from health departments in the transportation plans analyzed, or was it easy to detect that those departments were consulted? Yeah, there were only two cases where there were public health actors that were engaged, actively engaged in these planning processes. And it in one case, it informs like health equity data. So it really helped that social learning part of it, of informing conversation. And, and a couple of, and actually maybe three of the cities, health was often paired with equity. And so it was actually a way to describe inequities by talking about health disparities. 
And so health departments were, uh, this one health department was really helpful in building that connection. Um, otherwise, there it didn't seem like cities really relied on health departments to make the case for more healthy transportation. Like that was something that the community was asking for or the planners were asking for, but most of the time things were not framed as health. So that was like a big takeaway is that it wasn't necessarily helpful. Or it wasn't, an, as I said before, wasn't it an inherently superior way to frame something as healthy because it depends on who you're talking to and what their values are. So for the most part, things were framed as livability, quality of life, kind of typical planning terms. Um, and that tended to move people more than health, where health departments could be helpful or other public health actors is actually building the coalition to get support to implement the projects. So, I mean, it'd be great to get them at the table and help shape the conversations, just knowing that talking about health as health per se may or may not be make it more saleable, but you build a bigger coalition to be able to get stuff done by involving health actors. Great, and that might, uh, some of that might relate a little bit to this next question. Please speak to your learnings from working with data and metrics in this time, what different factions operate with their own facts, quote unquote. So yeah. did that come up? That, you know, there was only uh, one informant that I spoke with where that was an issue. It was kind of alluded to in a, uh, with, a, with another that he was at a public engagement event and said, you know, there were people, people had approached him like, well, th th that's your data. It's like, it's data, it's not my data. It's like, this, you know, <laughs> it's like, in general, that wasn't something that was a problem for these cities. Um, I just, you know, I think with all of this, the caveat is I studied cities with a population between 600,000 and 900,000 people. So what it looks like in smaller cities or in like, these were all principal cities of a region, or what if you studied a city that was a suburb in a, you know, in a region, like maybe there's a difference in the values and transportation and, and perception of data. Yeah. Yes. So Kelly, when you talk about cities, I think sometimes some of the most problematic roads are not city-owned roads, they're state-owned roads. Can you talk about the role, or did you talk to any informants from state DOTs and sort of their perception of this work? No, I didn't. And that would be, I chose municipalities to study this because they were understudied. So there's a lot more research, not necessarily on health indicators, but on indicators generally at the metropolitan level and the state level. And so I was interested in cities, cities are like building things, um, but, and so do state DOTs. So I interviewed folks from metropolitan planning organizations, but not from state DOTs. In those interviews, though, were people complaining about this? There was one. There was one complaint. Uh, there was one complaint from one city about some of the standards of the state DOT. Okay, and it does vary the city to city. How yeah. Many, how many of those state DOT yeah. facilities they might have? But I will say, I mean, it was less about the state and more about the FPO. One of the other findings from this, I was, and I, which surprised me, was how great the disconnect was between municipalities and their MPO. So, for the most part, when I asked municipalities, like, okay, well, you know, does the MPO influence the indicators? Like, are they nested with the indicators that you use? I mean, most informants from working at a municipal level kind of shrugged based effectively around um, the influence there. So it wasn't very impactful. All right, we are at one o'clock. Uh, there is still a remaining question from Roger, which we will forward to okay. you so you'll see it, but I wanna respect our time and hello, Roger, out there. And um, so uh, we are going to a last slide. And um, wanna thank Kelly again for her presentation. And for all of you who are out there on the web, you will be, after you sign out, you will be getting a, asked to take a short survey um, about uh, the seminar. And we really appreciate your feedback on that. And 
Uh, I'm a little rusty. I haven't done one of these in a little while. I think that's it. So thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you.